Hello, members and people of the podcast. Welcome back to Joan of Arc. We're going to continue now with the fairy tree of Domremy. Ah, Domremy was like any other humble little hamlet of that remote time and region. It was a maze of crooked, narrow lanes and alleys shaded and sheltered by the overhanging thatch roofs of the barn-like houses. The houses were dimly lighted by wooden shuttered windows, that is, holes in the walls which served four windows. The floors were dirt, and there was very little furniture. Sheep and cattle grazing was the main industry. All the young folks tended flocks. The situation was beautiful, from one edge of the village, a flowery plain, extending a wide sweep to the river. The muse from the rear edge of the village. A grassy slope rose gradually, and at the top was a great oak forest, a forest that was deep and gloomy and dense, and full of interest for us children, for many murders had been done in it by outlaws in old times, and it was earlier times of prodigious dragons that spouted fire and poisonous vapours from their nostrils had their homes in there. In fact, one was still living in there in our own time. It was as long as a tree and had a body as big around as it is, and scales like overlapping great tiles, deep ruby eyes as large as a cavalier's hat, and an anchor flute on its tail as big as I don't know what, but very big. Even unusually so for a dragon, as everybody said, who knew about dragons. It was thought that this dragon was of a brilliant blue colour, with gold mottlings, but no one had ever seen it. Therefore, this was not known to be so. It was only an opinion. It was not my opinion. I think there's no sense in forming an opinion when there's no evidence to form it on. If you build a person without any bones, any more hair, he may look fair enough to the eye, but he will be limber and cannot stand up, and I consider that evidence is the bones of my any opinion, the opinion in general. But I will take up this matter more at large at another time, and try to make the justness of my position appear. As to that dragon, I always held the belief that its colour was gold and without blue, for that has always been the colour of dragons. But this dragon lay up but a little way when he, within the wood at one time, is shown by the fact that Pierre Morel, who was in there one day and smelt it and recognised it by the smell, it gives one a horrid idea of how near to us the deadliest danger can be, and we not suspect it. In the earliest times, a hundred knights from many remote places in the earth would have gone in there, one after another, to kill the dragon and get the reward. But in our time, that method had gone out, and the priest had become the one that abolished the dragon. Pierre Guillaume Font did it in this case. He had a procession with candles and incense and banners, and marched around the edge of the wood and exorcised the dragon, and it was never heard of again. Although it was the opinions of many that the smell never wholly passed away, not that any had ever smelt the smell again, for none had. It was only an opinion. Unlike that other, unlacked bones, you see. I know that the creature was there before the exorcism, but whether it was there afterward or not is a thing I cannot be so positive about. In a noble open space, carpeted with grass on the high ground towards the stood a most majestic beech tree with wide-reaching arms, a grand spread of shade, and by it limped a spring of cold water. And on summer days the children went there, oh, every summer, for more than five hundred years, went there and sang and danced around the tree for hours together, refreshing themselves at the spring from time to time, and it was most lovely and enjoyable. Also, they had wreaths of flowers that hung them, um, we hung them upon the tree about the spring to please the fairies that lived there, for they liked that, being idle, innocent little creatures, as all fairies are, 
and fond of anything delicate and pretty like wildflowers put together in that way. And in return for this attention, the fairies did any friendly thing they could for the children, such as keeping the spring always full and clear and cold, driving away serpents and insects that stung, and, so there was never any unkindness between the fairies and the children, during more than five hundred years, a tradition, a thousand years, but only the warmest affection and most perfect trust and confidence. Whenever a child died, the fairies mourned, just as that child's playmate did, and the sign of it was there to see. For before the dawn, on the day of the funeral, they hung a little immortelle over the place where that child used to sit under the tree. I know this to be true by my own eyes. It is not hearsay. And the reason it was known that the fairies did this was this, that it was made all of black flowers of a sort not known in France anywhere. Now from time, immemorial all children reared in Dom Remy were called the children of the tree, and they loved that name, for it carried with it a mystic privilege that granted to any of us of the children of this world, which was this, whenever one of these came to die, then beyond the vague and formless images, drifting through his darkening mind rose soft and rich and fair, a vision of the tree. If all was well with his soul, that was what some said. Others said the vision came in two ways, once as a warning, once or two years in advance of death, when the soul was the captive of sin, and then the tree appeared in its desolate winter aspect. Then that soul was smitten with an awful fear. If repentance came and purity of life, the vision came again, and this time it was a summer clad and beautiful, but if it were Otherwise, with that soul, the vision was withheld, and it passed from life knowing its doom. Still, others said that the vision came but once, and they're only to the sinless dying forlorn in distant lands and pitifully longing for some last dear reminder of their home. And what reminder of it could go to their hearts like the picture of the tree that was a darling of their love and the comrade of their joys and comforter of their small griefs all through divine days, of their vanished youth. Now, the several traditions were, as I have said, some believing one and some another, one of them I knew to be the truth, and that was the last one. I do not say anything against the others. I think they were true, but I only know that the last one was, and in my thought, that if one kept to the things he knows and not trouble about the things which he cannot be sure about, he will have the steadier mind for it, and there is profit in that. I know that when the children of the tree die in a far land, then, if they be at peace with God, they turn their longing eyes towards home, and therefore shining, as through a rift in the cloud that curtains heaven, they see the soft picture of the fairy tree, clothed in a dream of golden light, and they see the bloomy mead sloping away to the river, and to their perishing nostrils is blown faint and sweet the fragrance of the flowers of home. And then the vision fades and passes, but they know, they know, and by their transfigured faces you know also. You who stand looking on, yes, you know the message that has come, and that has come from heaven. Joan and I believed alike about the matter, but Pierre Morel and Jacques d'Arc and many others believed that the vision appeared twice to a sinner. In fact, they and many others said they knew it, probably because their fathers had known it and had told them, for one gets most things at second hand in this world. Now, one thing that does make it quite likely that there were really two apparitions of the tree in this pact. From the most ancient times, if one saw a villager of ours with a face ash white and rigid with a ghastly fright, it was common for everyone to whisper to his neighbour, Ah, ah, he's in sin, and he's got the warning. And the neighbour would shudder at the thought and whisper back, Yeah, poor soul, he has seen the tree. Such evidence as these have their weight. They are not to be put aside with a wave of a hand. 
a thing that is backed by the cumulative evidence of centuries naturally gets nearer and nearer to being proof all the time. And if this continue and continue, it will someday become authority, and authority is a bed of rock and will abide. In my long life, I've seen several cases where the tree appeared announcing a death which was still far away. But in none of these was a person in a state of sin. No, the apparition in these cases only a special grace, in place of deferring the tidings of that soul's redemption till the day of death. The apparition brought them long before and with them peace, peace that might no more be disturbed, the eternal peace of God. I myself, old and broken, wait with serenity, for I have seen the vision of the tree, I have seen it, and am content. Always from the remotest times when the children joined hands and danced around the fairy tree, they sang a song, which was the tree's song, the song of Le Brefe de Molemont. They sang it to a quaint sweet air, a solace in sweet air which has gone murmuring through my dreaming spirit all my life when I was weary and troubled, resting me and carrying me through night and distance home again. No stranger can now or feel what that song has been. Through the drifting centuries, it to exile children of the tree, homeless and heavy of heart, in countries foreign to their speech and ways. You will think it a simple thing, that song, a poor perchance, but if you will remember what it was to us, and what it brought before our eyes when it floated through our memories, then you will respect it and you will understand how the water wells up in our eyes and makes all things dim, and our voices break and we cannot sing the last lines. And when in exile, wandering, wandering, shall fainting yearn for glimpse of there or rise upon our sight. And you will remember that Joan of Arc sang this song with us around the tree, when she was a little child, and always loved it, and that hallows it, yes, you will grant that song of the children. Now what has kept your leaves so green? The children's tears, they brought each grief. And you did comfort them and cheer them, their braised hearts and steal a tear that healed rose a leaf. And what has built you up so strong, a brave fée de bonnement? The children's love, they loved you long, ten hundred years in sooth. They nourished you with praise and song and warmed your heart and kept it growing a thousand years of youth. Bide always green in our young hearts, a brave de Beaumont, and we shall always youthful be, not heeding time his flight. And when in exile wandering, we shall fainting yearn for glimpse of thee, or rise upon our sight. The fairies were still there. That is a song, by the way, when we were children. But we never saw them, because a hundred years before that, the priest of Dornamé had held a religious function under the tree and denounced them as being blood kin to the fiend and barred them from redemption. And then he warned them never to show themselves again, nor hang any more immortals on the pain of the perpetual banishing from that parish. All the children pleaded for the fairies and said they were good friends and dear to them and never did them any harm. But the priest would not listen and said it was sin and shame to have such friends. The children mourned and could not be comforted and they made an agreement among themselves. They would always continue being to bring the flower flower wreaths on the tree so they could be hung as a perpetual sign to the fairies that they were still loved and remembered though lost to sight 
But late one night a great misfortune befell. Edmund Aubrey's mother passed by the tree, and the fairies were stealing a dance, not thinking anybody was by, and they were so busy and so intoxicated with wild happiness of it, and with the bumpers of dew sharpened up with honey which they had been drinking, that they noticed nothing. So Dame Aubrey stood there, astonished and admiring, and saw the little fantastic atoms, holding hands as many as three hundred of them, tearing around in great ring, half as big as an, an ordinary bedroom, and leaning away back and spreading their mouths with laughter and song, which she could hear quite distinctively, and kicking their legs up as much as three inches from the ground in perfect abandon and hilarity. Oh, the very maddest and witchy, witchingest dance the woman ever saw. But in about a minute or two minutes, the poor little ruined creatures discovered her. They burst out in one heart-breaking squeak of grief and terror and fled every which way. With their wee hazel nut fists in their eyes and crying as so disappeared. The heartless woman, no, the foolish woman, she was not heartless, but only thoughtless, went straight home and told the neighbours all about it. Whilst we, the small friends of the fairies, were asleep and not witting the calamity that was to come upon us, and all unconscious that we ought to be up and trying to stop these fatal tongues. In the morning everybody knew, and the disaster was complete, for when everybody knows a thing, the priest knows it, of course. We all flocked to be our front, crying and begging, begging and begging. <laughs> And he had to cry too, seeing our sorrows, for he had most kind and gentle nature, and he did not want to banish the fairies, and said so, but said he had no choice, for it had been declared that if they ever revealed themselves to man again, they must go. This all happened at the worst time possible for Joan of Arc. She was ill of fever, and out of her head, and what could we do? Who had not her gifts of reasoning and persuasion. We flew in a swarm to a bed and cried out, Jeanne, wake, wake, there is no moment to lose. Come and plead for the fairies, come and save them, only you can do it. But her mind was wandering. She did not know what we said, nor what we meant. So we went away, knowing all was lost. Yes, all was lost forever, lost. The faithful friends of the children for five hundred years must go and never come back any more. It was a bitter day for us, that day that Pierre Front held the function under the tree and banished the fairies. We could not wear mourning that any could have noticed. It would not have been allowed. So we had to be content with some poor small rag of black tied upon our garments when it made no show. But in our hearts we were mourning, big and noble, and occupying all the room, for our hearts were ours, and they could not get at them to prevent that. The great tree, la brefe de Bollemont, was its beautiful name, was never afterward quite as much to us as it had been before, but it was always dear. It's dear to me yet when I go there now, once a year in my old age, to sit under it and bring back the lost playmates of my youth and group them about me, look upon their faces through my tears and break my heart. Oh, my God, no. The place was not quite the same afterward. In one or two ways, it could not be. For the fairies, the protection had gone. The spring lost much of its freshness and coldness and more than two-thirds of its volume, and the banished serpents and stinging insects returned and multiplied and became a torment, and remained to be so this day. When that wise little child, Joan, got well, we realised how much her illness had cost us, for we found that we had been right in believing she could save the fairies. She burst into a great storm of anger, for so little a creature, and went straight to Pierre Front, 
and stood up before him where he sat, and made a reverence, and said, The fairies were to go if they showed themselves to people again. Is it not so? Yes, that is, dear. If a man comes prying into a person's room at midnight, when that person's half naked, will you say this is unjust? Unjust as to say that the person is showing himself in that man? Well, no, the good priest looked a little troubled and uneasy when he said it. It is a sin, a sin anyway, even if one did not intend to commit it. Pierre Front threw up his hands and cried out, Oh, my poor little child, I see all my fault. And he drew her to his side and put an arm around her and tried to make, her, make peace with her. But her temper was up so high that he could not get it down right away but buried her head against his breast and broke out crying and said then the fairies committed no sin for there was no intention to commit one they not knowing that any one was by and because they were little creatures and could not speak for themselves and say the law was against the intention not against the innocent act because they had no friend to think that simple thing for them and say it they had been sent away from their home forever, and it was wrong, wrong to do it. The good father hugged her yet closer to his side and said, Oh, and not out of the mouths of babes and sucklings, the heedless and unthinking are condemned. Would God I bring the little creatures back for your sake? And mine, yes, and mine, for I have been unjust. There, there, don't cry. Nobody could be sorrier than your poor old friend. Don't cry, dear, but I cannot stop right away. I've got to, and it is no little matter. This thing that you have done is being sorry penance enough for such an act. Pierre Front turned away his face, for it would have hurt her to see him laugh and said, Oh, thou remorseful but most just accuser. No, it is not. I will put on sackcloth and ashes. There, are you satisfied? Joan's sobs began to diminish, and she presently looked up at the old man through her tears and said in a simple way, Yeah, that will do, if it will clear you. Pierre Font would have been moved to laugh again, perhaps, if he had not remembered in time that he had made a contract, and not a very agreeable one. It must be fulfilled. So he got up and went to the fireplace, Joan watching him with deep interest, and took a shovelful of cold ashes and was going to empty them onto his old grey head when a better idea came to him and he said, Would you mind helping me, dear? How, father? He got down on his knees and bent his head low and said, Take the ashes and put them on my head for me. The matter ended there, of course. The victory was with the priest. One can imagine how the idea of a such a profanation would strike Joan or any other child in the village. She ran and dropped upon her knees by his side and said, Oh, it is dreadful. I don't know that was what one meant by sackcloth and ashes. Do please get up, father. But I can't until I am forgiven. Do you forgive me? I, oh, you have done nothing to me. Father, it is yourself. That must forgive yourself for wronging those poor things. Please get up, Father, won't you? But I am worse off now than I was before. I thought I was earning your forgiveness, but it is my own. I can't be lenient. It won't not become me. Now what can I do? Find me some way out of this with wise little head. The Pierre would not stir. For all Joan's pleadings, she was about to cry again. Then... She had an idea, and seized the shovel, and deluged her own head with the ashes, stammering out through the chokings and suffocation. There, now it is done. Oh, please get up, father. The old man, both touched and amused, gathered her to his breast and said, Oh, you incomparable child, it's a humble martyrdom, and not of sort presentable in a picture. But... The right and true spirit is in it, that I testify, when he bloody right and all. Well, 
Then he brushed the ashes out of her hair and helped her scour her face and neck properly. Tidy yourself up. He was in fine spirits now and ready for further argument. So he took his seat and drew Joan to his side and said, Joan, you were used to making wreaths at the fairy tree with the other children, is it not so? That was the way he'd always seen them. You know, he saw from the corner of his eye. He was always watching. Anyway, it, she seemed to enjoy it. I knew he was going to drop corn along in front of Joan now. And Joan answered, yes, father. Did you hang them on the tree? No, father. Didn't hang them there? No. Why didn't you? I, well, I didn't wish to. I didn't wish to. No, father. What did you do with them? I hung them in your church. Why didn't you want them to hang in the tree? Because it was said that the fairies were of kin to the fiend, and that it was simple to show them honour. Did you believe it was wrong to honour them so? Yes, I thought it was. must be wrong. Then, if it was wrong to honour them in that way, and if they were of kin to the fiend... They could be dangerous company for you and for the other children, couldn't they? I suppose so. Yes, I think so. He stood in a minute, and I judged he was going to spring his trap. And he did. He said, Then the matter stands like this. They were banned creatures of fearful origin. They could be dangerous company for our children. Now give me a rational reason, dear, if you can think of any, why you call it a wrong to drive them into banishment. And why you would have saved them from it. In a word, what loss have you suffered by it? How stupid of him to go and throw his case away like that. I could have boxed his ears for vexation if he had been a boy. He was going all along, right until he ruined everything, by winding up in a foolish and fatal way. What had she lost by it? Was he never going to find out? What kind of child Joan of Arc was? Was he never going to learn that things which merely concerned her own gain or loss she cared nothing about? Could he never get the simple fact into his head that the sure way and the only way to rouse her up and set her on fire was to show her where some other person was going to suffer wrong or hurt or loss? Why he had gone and set a trap for himself? That was all he had accomplished. The minute those words were out of his mouth, her temper was up, and her indignant tears rose in her eyes. And she burst on him with an energy and passion which astonished him, but didn't astonish me, for I knew he had fired a mine when he touched off his ill-chosen climax. Oh, father, how can you talk like that? Who owns France? God and the king. Not Satan, Satan, my child. This is the front stool of the Most High. Satan owns a one full of soil. Then who gave those poor creatures their home? God. Who protected them in it all, those centuries? God. Who allowed them to dance and play there those centuries and found no fault with it? God. Who disapproved of God's approval and put a threat upon them? A man. Who caught them again in harmless sport that God allowed and the man forbade, and carried out that threat? And who drove the poor things away from a home? The good God gave them in his mercy and his pity, and sent down his rain and dew and sunshine upon it five hundred years in token of his peace. It was their home, theirs, by the grace of God and his good heart, and no man had the right to rob them of it and they were the gentlest truest friends and children ever had and did did them sweet and loving service all these five long centuries never hurt any or harm and the children loved them and now they mourn for them and there is no healing for their grief and what have the children done that they should suffer the cruel stroke the poor fairies it could have been dangerous company for the children, yes, but never had been. And 
Could is no argument. Kinsmen of the fiend. What of it? Kinsmen of the fiend have rights. And these add. And children have rights. And these add. And if I had been there, I would have spoken. I would have begged for the children, the fiends, and stayed. Your hand and saved them all. But now, oh now, all is lost. Everything is lost and there is no help, no more. Then she finished with a blast at the idea that fairy kinsmen of the fiend ought to be shunned and denied human sympathy and friendship because salvation was barred against them. She said that for that very reason people ought to pity them and do every humane and loving thing they could to make them forget the hard fate that had been put upon them by accident of birth and no fault of their own. Poor little creature, she said. What can a person's heart be made of that can pity a Christian child and yet can't pity a devil's child? That's a thousand times more needs. That child needs it more. She had torn loose from Pierre Front and was crying with the knuckles in her eyes and stamping the small feet in fury. And now she burst out of the place and was gone before we could gather our senses together out of this storm of words and his whirlwind of passion. The Pierre had got upon his feet toward the last and now he stood there passing his hands back and forth across his forehead, like a person who is dazed and troubled. Then he turned and wandered toward the door of his little workroom, and as he passed through it, I heard him mutter sorrowfully, Ah, me, poor children, poor fiends, they have rights. And she said, True, I never thought of that. God forgive me, I am to blame. When I heard that, I knew I was right in the thought that he had set a trap for himself. It was so, and he had walked into it, you see. I seemed to feel encouraged and wondered if, mayhap, I might get him into one. But upon reflection, my heart went down, for this was not my gift. And that's the end of the second part of the Joan of Arc. But that just actually shows us how headstrong of a person that she was and how she thought about things. I mean, even from a young child, as you can see, it wasn't about evil, good, bad, wrong. It it was about treating everyone the same, giving everyone the same rights as she wanted to do for the fairies, but was too ill to do so. But she sure as hell told that priest... <laughs> So I, I like that. Very, very strong-headed from the start, um, which I think is something to admire, really, because back then, you have to remember as well, it was a lot harder for a child to come out with something like that back then than it is now. Now we can expect a child to speak up. Back then, not so. So when she speaks up like that, I just find it quite exhilarating. I think it's wonderful. Anyway, thank you for listening and many blessings.